I'm going to get started off here with a, with a quick clip of some of the things that we build. I'll get into kind of why we're doing what we're doing and why it's important. Um, I'll talk a little bit through the, the, the tech problems that we're solving and how Foxglove kind of uh, takes care of uh, a lot of the really difficult problems from observability and a, and a hardware standpoint. And I'll, uh, and, I'll, and I'll leave off with a little bit of time for, for questions. So again, I'm going to be talking about why, why it's difficult to build for the ocean, um, some of the other challenges that we face, uh, manufacturing at scale, um, and specifically, you know, some of the challenges building and uh, in, in for the DoD customers. So get started off with a quick clip. These are our two of our platforms, Spyglass, which is a six-footer, and Cutlass, which is a 14-footer. Um, the things that you'll notice here are um, in the water, the kinematics of, of vehicles can be quite challenging. At different speeds, they kind of operate in different ways. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, at, at slow speeds, you kind of see vehicles that are in a displacement mode, which means they're pushing water around them. Uh, at high speeds, they're up on planes, so there's a little bit of lift at the front. Um, so kind of skipping across the surface of the water. Um, the larger one is Cutlass. Again, has a radar, has a mast on it. The smaller one is Spyglass. Um, and we manufacture these uh, in, in Austin, Texas. So who are we? Uh, we're a venture-backed defense tech company. Uh, we're focused on the, on the joint force, uh, specifically for the Navy. Um, we design and manufacture small autonomous surface vehicles at scale. A little bit about us, um, a couple more details. Um, we started almost two years ago. We raised some money. We've hired some great people. Um, and for the manufacturing uh, kind of folks in the room, we have about 150,000 square feet of, of manufacturing space in Austin to, to kind of build these systems. Um, I'll talk a little bit about you know, why this is important. So um, when we look at uh, kind of naval, naval shipbuilding and, and our shipbuilding facilities here in the United States, um, we are in a, a bit of a decline since um, our peak. Um, back in World War II, we built 18,000 naval, naval ships. Um, in this past year alone, we've deprecated ships out of the fleet. Um, on average, we're deprecating maybe anywhere from six to ten uh, ships a year. At this rate, you know, 50, 60 years from now, we'll actually have no, no ships. So we, well, the, the core problem that we're trying to solve is, is addressing that manufacturing need. Um, some of the challenges here, um, shipbuilding cycles are very long. You know, a lot of these ships take anywhere from eight to ten years to build. They're very expensive. Um, a lot of these shipbuilding programs are in the single-digit billions. Some, some are even in the the $10 billion, $10 billion range. Um, a lot of these massive ships also are struggling quite a bit uh, when it comes to low-cost attributable systems. So you have a small fleet that's kind of trying to attack uh, much larger exquisite systems. What, what we're seeing in, in kind of the world writ large is that these low-cost attributable systems are, are winning this battle. Um, we see this across the board in different geopolitical um, uh, kind of hot zones around the planet. These are the other platforms that we build. So Spyglass on the left side, um, it's a six-foot platform. Uh, you know, there's some of the range numbers up there. Uh, the, the kind of core elements that I'll, that I'll talk through um, are the three things that um, our autonomous systems do. They see, they communicate, and they move. So I'll kind of break that down as perception, uh, locomotion, and networking. And I'll go through kind of how Foxglove helps us with that and, and you know, what, are the, what are the big challenges on the water when we, when we try to address these. Second platform is Cutlass. Uh, the last one is Corsair. Can't reveal too much information about that yet. Um, but again, in the same sort of fleet and, and swarm of, um, of boats that, that Saronic builds. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of how our approach um, is, if, is differentiated here. Um, the first piece is vertical integration. So one, being able to, to sell to the United States um, and, and DoD customers, it's, it's kind of critical to make sure that you have ownership over supply chains, uh, you, you have transparency and visibility into to all of those routes. Um, what vertical integration, though, I think it's, it can be an overloaded term at times, what that really means for us is that we, own, we have ownership over the outcome. So we have ownership over you know, what kind of tools we're using, what materials we're using, who we're sourcing from. Uh, if we're doing any sort of custom integration work or, or, or custom fabrication, having ownership over that. And then finally, having ownership over the verification and validation steps. Um, oftentimes, when you have these kind of ecosystems where one person is doing the building, another person is doing validation, another person is doing the software integration, it kind of results in that Spider-Man meme when things go wrong, where everybody's kind of pointing at each other of not knowing where the failure mode is. What vertical integration really means to us is that you know, we have ownership over that, that success outcome and the success criteria. The second piece is, is fast iteration. I know a lot of folks um, in the room were, were talking about simulation earlier. Um, we, we take simulation very seriously. Uh, it, it's very much not a silver bullet for us. Um, it's, it's a way for us to dot our I's and cross our T's. Um, I, I like to say this a lot. If, if simulation perfectly matched reality, that's proof that we live in a simulation. Doesn't, doesn't seem like that's the case. Um, but one of the things that I tell software engineers all the time on our team, like our mantra for, for speed iteration, is that you know, if, we, if you build a new feature, you should be able to test that within 30 minutes in SIM, within 90 minutes on representative hardware. 
within 48 hours, that feature should be tested in the ocean. And so we've built an ecosystem and a testing pipeline with our mission operations team to, to enable that. Um, the third piece that I'll touch on is, is feature inheritance. So with vertical integration and kind of owning subsystems, components, fabrication, design, design for manufacturing, one of the things that we can do is we can share components across the stack. Um, it's good for the business because it makes, it makes your margins better, uh, but it also uh, enables us to, to have capabilities that are fielded at a much ha- faster rate. So one example that I'll give is, you know, when we first built Spyglass, uh, like in the, in the summer of last year, uh, a lot of those features were already present on Cutlass day one when it hit the water. Those things also remain the same when we, when we have our third platform hit the water as well. A lot of those early features, whether they're networking, whether they're perception tooling, whether it's infrastructure on the, da- on the, on the back end or data side or a command and control side, um, all of those features um, are kind of inherited uh, by, by new platforms as we build them. Next, I'll go into kind of those three components that I talked about earlier, perception, controls, locomotion, and, and networking, and why they're difficult for us, uh, specifically when it comes to DoD customers, but also um, why they're difficult on the water. So you know, one of the things that's really important to us, and I think it's, it's kind of the, the, the trend across not just robotics, but, but things in, in this kind of application space, is passive sensing. Um, you can kind of think about you know, if, you, if you're turning on a radar in the middle of the ocean or you're turning on you know, a, a, a Wi-Fi card in the middle of the ocean, you basically have this light bulb at 2.4 gigahertz, or you have a light bulb at, you know, if, if you're a radar, you're an X-band or, or, or whatever frequency you're operating at. Somebody's going to find that. If you, can, you can see that if, if you have a software to find radio that's, that's actively looking for it. Um, so a critical piece of, of our technology is, is focusing on passive sensing. Um, what this really means is that you're able to not use active sensors and not, not kind of show your location, especially if you're performing clandestine operations. Um, the other piece that's really critical here is, is, is the targeting support. So the main reason that you know, we're using um, passive sensors to locate things and, and find things is so that we can relay that information to other places. Either that's, those are other assets that we're providing and those are assets of ours that are in the water, or there's, there's assets for, for that customers are using just so they have situational awareness across the board. One of the really tricky parts of, of doing this is, I think, um, one, of the, one of the speakers earlier talked about using thermal cameras. Um, using thermal cameras it can be quite challenging as well. Um, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of the details there, but I think one of the biggest pieces that, that we found is you know, the, the, the open source community and, and kind of the developer community is focused quite a bit on, on, on RGB sensors and, and sensors that are in the conventional visual spectrum. When we think about medium wave IR, we think about long wave IR, a lot of that developer infrastructure hasn't been built out yet, so a lot of that sort of custom tooling that, that needs to exist is, is, is done in-house. Um, there are a couple more clips from, from some of the things that we do and we test out in the ocean. The ocean is a fairly unforgiving place. Um, you know, salt water is basically cancer for electronics. You have one drop of salt water that hits your PCB, that's it. Um, we spend a lot of time testing out in the ocean. There's, there's boats in the, in, in the ocean right now. Um, we try to make sure that that cadence is fast so we can start to iterate um, very quickly on whether they're perception algorithms, whether it's controls, or whether it's redesigning you know, some of the components of our of, of hardware and, and networking. We try to make sure that, that systems are in the water as much as possible. Um, what you see on the right side are a couple of clips from, from our Fox Love panels of, of, of video data. Um, on, the, on the right side, you see kind of what foggy thermal data looks like. Uh, things can get quite challenging there. There's a phenom- phenomena that occurs called thermal crossover, which is when you have an asset that's a similar temperature as the background, they start to kind of blend in. Um, it's kind of, you're seeing a little bit of that on the right side there. Um, on the bottom, you're seeing kind of what, what kind of tracks look like. So when you start to identify objects, where they are, where their position is, how fast they're moving. Uh, some of the work that we've done here around uh, our, our work in the embedding space, um, you know, we're using tool, uh, open source implementations of things like Clip to try and iterate on how do we get better and fine-tuned embedding models that work well at kind of differentiating targets uh, out on the ocean. Um, it juxtaposed to the self-driving car space where you kind of have a very cluttered environment. You can have a lot of people. You can have children running through or pets. Um, the ocean can be calm at times, and so your, your sensitivity thresholds can kind of need to vary dynamically. If you're in the middle of a shipping lane, you're going to have a lot of noise, a lot of buoys. There's kind of rules of the road that you, that you have to obey. Um, in the middle of the open ocean, it's kind of anything's fair game. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the ocean is a fairly unforgiving place. Um, a couple of the things that I'll, I'll kind of show here in, in kind of glimpses. Um, again, more, more kind of thermal imagery. Um, you can kind of see that the temperature of water, um, even though in, in theory is, is the specific heat of the water is fairly high, and you have a consistent water temperature across the board, those thermal differences as a function of solar glare can, can make themselves very clear, especially when you're looking at, at it through, through thermal cameras. Um, on the left side is, is kind of some examples of some of our experiments around simulation. Um, what we've done here is tried to get Cutlass or Spyglass to, to hallucinate information. 
We've trained a couple of VQ, VAE models to try and see, like, if you want to test in um, and, and a, a very complicated sea state, you know, if you want to test during a storm, for example, no boat captain is going to let you do that. No one's going to willingly kind of put their lives at risk during a storm to, to, to just go test your robot. So one of the things that's really critical for us to do is be able to have good tooling and good simulation tooling to kind of generate data um, that, that looks a lot more noisy than it is um, so we can be prepared for, for, for challenging environments. Um, talk a little bit about locomotion. Um, so in, in the video earlier, you guys probably saw it kind of low speeds. You're, again, I mentioned you're pushing water around you. At higher speeds, you're kind of up on step or up on plane, which means you're skipping across the surface. Um, what that means is that you actually have two different kind of uh, you know, kinematic states. Um, the, the surface of the water is one of the more challenging environments because you're in a two-fluid environment. You have both water and, and air to, to worry about versus you know, subsurface or, or aerial. Um, and you can very clearly see in, in a lot of the data that these regimes are different. It, it affects your control schema. It affects your, your control authority as well. Um, on the right here, you have kind of a conventional graph from like a naval architecture textbook, and then that data is kind of represented in, in kind of the foxglove pa panel above, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, what you see is that you can push the same amount of power dissipation into the water, um, and at that same level, you can increase speed, but there's, there's kind of this bimodal distribution of efficiency that you know, we're always trying to, we're always trying to uh, sort of play against, um, and that changes as a function of sea state. So you know, if you're in a lake, if you're in a swimming pool, these numbers look different. If you're in the middle of a storm in C state four, where you know you have an eight foot swell, these numbers look different. So again, the, just just to reiterate, the ocean can be quite a, quite an unforgiving place. And so, for us, the, the critical thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is we are just testing constantly, constantly putting boats in the water in different conditions, in, in different even in different oceans. So like the Atlantic versus the Pacific are are two two different environments as well. The, the ocean temperature is different. The salinity can be different. Um, so we try to make sure that we collect as much data as possible. The last piece that I'll mention here, um, from, a, from a networking standpoint, um, networking on the water can, can be quite difficult as well. Um, the instrumentation here is, is fairly critical for us. Um, we have redundant modes of communication, uh, whether they're, they're beyond line of sight or, or line of sight payloads. Um, the critical piece, though, is that on the water, if you have you know, salt water hitting your antennas or, or it's, it's covering the surface of something that needs you know, RF broadcast or, or a direct directional antenna, you are going to lose quality of service. So for us, we have, Fox of we have, we have RF engineers and, and electrical engineers using these Foxlove dashboards to make sure that they're actually designing hardware systems the right way as well. So you know, kind of the, the way that we'd like to, to address this is making sure that you know, you've instrumented a subsystem. You can make sure that uh, you know, you're getting the right data off of that bus. Um, an electrical engineer can kind of grok it very quickly, make sure they can you know, affect design decision changes or, or manufacturing changes. And then the next step forward is uh, deploying that into production. And, and it's the same, same kind of dashboard that's used uh, in, in that environment as well. Um, the, the last thing that I'll say about, about networking is that in a lot of these environments, especially in kind of a military context, a lot of these RF frequencies can be, are, are open to jamming. Uh, they, they can be very quickly visible. And so a lot of the things that are very critical to instrument are when do we want to have certain frequencies on or certain frequencies off, um, and then making sure that you know, those actually align to the mission standards or the, or the con ops that, that you know, our customers want to execute. Um, one of, the, one of the biggest tricky p components here is that if you actually want to you know, turn off um, you know, an, an RF link, especially if it's, a, if it's like some omnidirectional sensor, um, these sensors are always chirping. And so even if you have you know, your, your Bluetooth device in your pocket right now, it's still emitting, um, it's still emitting some sort of signature. And so it's, it's critical to actually turn these payloads off. Um, and so from, from an RF standpoint, you know, we've kind of made sure that we are instrumenting all of these things. So from an autonomy standpoint, you can have autonomous behaviors that are not just a function of what you're seeing visually, but also what you're seeing in kind of the RF environment. Um, and, and those are things that are really critical, especially when we think about um, kind of the, the, the military context of things. So anyway, with that, I'll, I'll end. It was kind of perception, controls, networking were the, were the three big things that I wanted to hit. But again, we are Saronic, we build autonomous boats. You know, thank, you, thank you for your time.